Hello and welcome to another Working From Home episode of No Such Thing As A Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from four undisclosed locations in the UK. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with James Harkin, Andrew Hunter-Murray, Anna Tuzinski, and once again we have gathered around the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days, and in no particular order, here we go. Starting with you, Andy. My fact is that spies can tell what people are saying by looking at the lights in the room they're in. (laughs) So this is a new spying technique which has been discovered or uh, I don't know what you do with spying techniques, but it's been found out by researchers from uh, the Ben-Gurion University of the Negev and the Weizmann Institute of Science. And what they found is that there are lots of different ways of eavesdropping on people. And this one is called Lamphone. And what it means is, if we're all talking in our rooms, if there's a light bulb, uh, and it has to be a hanging light bulb, so, you know, a classic bulb, um, your conversation will make tiny, tiny vibrations on the surface, and that will slightly affect the light inside the bulb. And you can get very cheap equipment, like costs a couple of hundred dollars, and you just observe the light bulb from outside the room, and you can pick up what people are talking about uh, you can decode can you speeches. Run... Yeah, so you can... Is it, It's not like Morse. It's not translating into Morse. You can pick no. up the actual sound? Well, I think it has to be translated from light bulb language into sound. <laughs> but it is... <laughs> okay. It is. Like, so what... it is light bulb language. Yeah, but they can They uh-huh. can even... You can Shazam the song that someone is playing in a room. That's how... No. Ac- yeah. Wow. Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? And they, they reckon <laughs> that um, they took a snippet of a speech by Donald Trump and they could understand what he was saying, which is quite impressive because most Amazing. people can't understand what he's saying most of the time anyway. <laughs> can we do a light, light bulb episode of Fish that we just release in light bulb language and people can decode down the line? Yeah, good idea. Yeah, yeah. that won't yeah. present any technical problem. It's hard enough doing it on Zoom, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Is this? Do they use lasers for this to uh, reflect? Because you can't just pin your ear to the window and listen to the vibrations coming off the no. light bulb or anything, presumably. Do they, they bounce? Is it lasers? They bounce off it. Yeah, it's uh, but invisible lasers, <laughs> so you won't notice a kind of sniper dot on your light bulb. So you won't be able to tell you're being spied on. What it is actually, I believe, not a laser. I think. Oh. I think it's just a telescope. So you get the light and an electro optical sensor. Now, that might have a laser in it, for all I know. But I no, think what it is, it's, it right. takes the light in and it can sense the very, very slight changes in light. Can I just say why I flubbed that? It's because there's a separate thing called a laser microphone. Which oh, okay. Was, mm. <laughs> this was used, this is where you, spy, you fire a laser at the windows of a room and you can eavesdrop that way. And this was used in 2013 in a place called Abbottabad, and it was used to find out that there was an extra person inside a building in Abbottabad. And that extra person who never left the building turned out to be Osama bin Laden. Wow. Ah. So that's how they found out there was an extra person inside that building who never went outside. Wow. And do you know who invented this, this laser? No. It was Leon Theremin, the inventor of the theremin. (laughs) (laughs) That instrument? Was it? Do the noise again, Dan. <laughs> you should explain what the theremin is, as well as doing that excellent impersonation. I think we have mentioned it before. Yeah, so theremins are, you will have seen them possibly, um, as an instrument that I, don't, I actually don't know how they work technically. They give off electromagnetic waves, don't they? And your um, hand can disrupt them and they make a noise. Yeah, so people use their hand. If you see them sort of pushing forward and backwards their hand, it will sort of make that yeah, kind of... Yeah, it's basically a ghost impression, is what it sounds like. <laughs> so Leon Theremin <laughs> invented what basically was the precursor to the modern laser microphone that we have today, and it was used by uh, the Soviet Union, um, and he was given a Stalin Prize for inventing this, what was advanced espionage technology. So wow. so Theremin found Osama bin Laden. Wow. That's amazing. That's sort of spooky. <laughs> 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 the other thing that Theremin did really interestingly was he had invented basically like the technology you have on contactless credit cards. He put one of those in a giant wooden seal. And when I say seal, I don't mean the animal. I mean like <laughs> a kind of a symbol of the United States and then gave it to the US 
embassy somewhere, I think, and they had it up in their room. But what they didn't realize is there was a tiny chip in there and that they could hear what was happening by um, using this contactless technology, I think. Yep. Yeah, you're completely right. They didn't have to go up to the seal. The Soviets didn't have to go up to the seal and then sort of tap on it (laughs) to get the sound files out. But they sort of fired uh, electromagnetic beams at it, didn't Mm. they? And that activated it, just like your Oyster card is activated by the ticket stand. Uh, It was called The Thing. The Thing? Wow. That's what seal. it was called. Oh, yeah, yeah, the seal yeah, yeah. was called the thing. Um, Soviet school children gave it to the U.S. embassy in, or the U.S. ambassador in 1945, and they managed to get seven years of espionage recording out of it. Wow, yeah. that's so cool. How did they make sure the U.S. ambassador put it in the right room? I, I, it was so big, I think, that I had to go on the wall somewhere. I don't think they could guarantee <laughs> the room. But also, it was completely made of wood. So they they thought, this is definitely safe. There's yeah. no way this is a spying tool. And the really okay. clever thing about those kind of chips that you have in your credit card and in your Oyster card is they don't need any power, do they? The, all the power yeah. comes from the thing that's scanning them. Um, you know Edward Snowden? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. He has a secret device to stop himself being spied on, which is a blanket over his head. Mm. Is that what inspires you? Because you do that sometimes when we record. And I thought it was just to embellish the ghost impression that you've been honing. No, it's just, that's just social anxiety. But Edward Snowden has, um, he calls it his magic mantle of power. Oh my and basically, days. it's to stop targeted video surveillance. Because obviously, if you're Edward Snowden, you know, leaking secrets, there's a chance someone will be trying to spy on you. Yeah. So he just puts a blanket over his head when he types his password in. I remember reading an article about, was it Glenn Greenwald who who interviewed him? Yeah. Someone like that. And they said that whenever they went into his hotel room or his house or whatever, they always made you put your phone in the microwave. As soon as you walked mm. in, that was what you always had to do. Mm-hmm. I think Snowden makes people put it in the refrigerator. Oh, does he? Is his. Yeah. How does it work, Andy, though? If he's put it over his head... Yeah. He's not going to be able to see what he's typing, A, but also it's just his eyeballs that are not seeing. I reckon Edward Snowden could touch type. <laughs> <laughs> but still, what what are they recording? His, Dan, his brain? all of him is under the blanket. Oh, he's in a fort. In case... he's no, in a... <laughs> he, no. Uh, well, yes. he's got a blanket over his head and his hands, basically. It's in case there's someone, a camera in the room that would film what he's typing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've, you've got to assume that. that he's done the very basic putting masking tape over the camera on his laptop, because if he's missed that trick, oh, he's yeah. an absolute love to. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know what? They can tell what you're typing by just listening to the sound of your typing on your keyboard. Mm. So um, there are some researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, actually it's Doug Tiger and his team, and they've worked out every time you click a button, it makes a very, very slightly different sound to the other ones, but you can't really tell which one is which, but what you can do is you can take all the clicks and then work out the one that comes most often is probably E, oh. and if there are two letters together, um, these researchers, they realise that it could be TH or it could be ER, and it could definitely not be BF because there are no words with BF next to each other. What the hell? Of so, course there are. What if you're like... Me and my BF are both hardcore spies. Exactly. If you if you are Edward Snowden, here's a little tip for him, and he's in his little fort, and you want to trick the FBI, just keep writing about your BFF. Yeah. <laughs> he's been a major sort of revealer of a lot of these secrets that we've been researching, hasn't he? So um, he a lot of stuff came out on the back of his revelations. So I think, for instance, when The Guardian was doing their investigation and they got hold of a lot of the documents, they were told that they weren't allowed to keep any of the Edward Snowden files in their offices because the government thought that they could be spied on by laser microphones just bouncing off their glasses of water and stuff like that. So it's not just the windows. <laughs> it's if you've got a mug of tea or anything similar to that, they could do that. Um, and yeah, he's in the wake of his revelations, a lot of countries took action to make sure that the US or the NSA couldn't spy on them too much anymore. So Germany, for instance, invested in a whole bunch of typewriters, which I don't know if this would have solved Mm. the typing issue. But the idea is that if you're writing on a typewriter, there's no digital memory of it anywhere. You've just got it on Mm. a bit of paper in that weird old school font. And then I guess you just post it to somebody. But it is quite annoying if you need to share a document with 20 other people. (laughs) I don't know what you do. But yeah, and Russia, I think, spent 10 grand on antique typewriters after that. Really? Do any of you guys have a typewriter? I have one. And they're a pain to use compared with a computer. (laughs) That's so annoying. Like, they just always get stuck. And whenever you make a mistake, you can't press delete. James, why are you writing on a typewriter? That's a big question for me. 
Well, I, you know, I, I'm married to a Russian. <laughs> um, no, I got I got one as a gift, and I really liked nice. it. And I thought I might try typing on it, but it's really a fucking annoying. It does seem like a pain. Yeah. yeah. Um, it must be so annoying for all these people who work in spy centres coming up with new ways of spying on people that some dorky scientists are just <laughs> publishing these papers going, oh, we found out that they must be reading light bulbs. You're like, damn it, that took me years. I, I created the technology to read light bulbs and now we're going to look for something else? What next? Yeah, because some people mm, do yeah. that. People, are, I think there's a company, a data analysis company called Palantir, in the, which is used by the US Secret Service. So they must know what they're doing. And they have designed their windows to have these things that they call acoustic transducers on them, which basically, if you try to use the window vibrations, it just sends out white noise or something. Maybe it sends out some oh. kind of ha ha prank wow. you uh, message to anyone. <laughs> that would be yeah. brilliant if you could hack your window to send other messages. Yeah. That'd be yeah. cool. <laughs> but I think, isn't that why uh, governments would use net curtains? I think that's why, because that supposedly dampened the um, vibrations. But the, the other governments which use net curtains, because I, I associate so. them with suburbia in the <laughs> 1950s, and you have to have an old lady peering around them yeah. to see what the neighbours are doing. Um, you know the Sopranos, the, the great TV series, yeah. the mobster TV series? So um, it was so realistic, it was so on point for what would happen in the real life of a mobster that mobsters started thinking there must be someone on the inside who is leaking information um, to the writers and producers producers of the show and we know that they had those conversations because the FBI were actually wiretapping the mobsters who had that conversation and fed that back to the writers and producers of The Sopranos but they used to listen <laughs> in to conversations of mobsters going did you see The Sopranos on Sunday how did they know that we do that kind of thing so come on Dan you could have done a better Italian American accent than that <laughs> <laughs> come on come on guys we didn't know what's the best Sopranos what? on a Sunday what's happening no nope, he couldn't Turns out. <laughs> Dan, you sounded like a Kiwi. You sounded New Zealandish, yeah, which is being... the opposite of being... That's I... New Jersey you're trying to get. You did New Zealand. <laughs> Do you think New Zealand is the opposite of being in The Sopranos? Because that probably is quite close. A harmless yeah, Kiwi. Pretty much is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you're right. Um, Dan, you know what you were saying about... Um, what is annoying that all these secrets come out it must be irritating if you're in the secret service. So I yeah. have a suspicion that everything we found out is all just fake news that's subtly put out by the CIA or MI5 to throw mm. us off the scent. Because it it's just so much they release. Like, there's this amazing or, book. Or, Anna, yeah? sorry, no? by Big Lampshade... Big. Could be them. Mm. That's Could such be. a good point. The lampshade companies trying to make us buy lampshades. You are absolutely bang on. Or candle. James, your pa- 1950s house. Is, <laughs> got, you've got your neck curtains. You've got your big fringe lampshade. The typewriter's out. <laughs> I am from Murder, She Wrote, <laughs> Jessica Fletcher or whatever she's called. I'm sorry, Anna, I interrupted um, So Big Lampshade or whoever it is has put out this fake news because th- this stuff that comes out is amazing. So there's a book called Spycraft, which came out in 2009, and it was written by the head of the Office of Technical Service, which is the CIA department that's responsible for all of their gadgets. So it's written by this former head wow. of that, and he just revealed this amazing stuff. But it sounds so important. Plausible. So he said that they used to, when they met business people or politicians or diplomats, they'd hand out gifts and they all the gifts would have like devices placed in them. So a bit like this uh, these school children. But so they'd hand out books or lighters or flower pots, apparently. So wow. but you just think if you're wait a minute, if you're gonna give a gift, right? Don't give a flower pot which they might put outside. Such you need to give them out. something that will... Th- oh, here's a milk bottle as a gift. <laughs> it's like, it's you've got to give them something that they'll definitely keep in the you're house. You're so right. The only noise you get from that is wind and then squirrels and foxes <laughs> desperately digging through Earth. I saw, a, I saw an amazing video online just while we're on the CIA. So the CIA has a chief of disguise which I didn't know. And the former chief of disguise does this video. She's called Jonna Mendez. And um, it's amazing. This video is her sitting talking about how you can slip into a disguise very quickly or the elaborate ways that they do it. And during the video, she slowly goes into different disguises. So suddenly she's an old man and it's, it's really incredible. And she was talking about a lot of the mythology of CIA disguise and what they do, particularly the Mission Impossible movies with wearing the sort of mm. fake head. 
And that's not far from the truth of what they did. And there's this fantastic set of photos when she went to meet George Bush Sr. to tell him about what they were up to, that she sat doing the whole meeting and then near the end rips off her (laughs) mask and has a different, her real head underneath and Bush didn't notice the entire time. You can see these photos, highly recommend. But he didn't notice her ripping off her own (laughs) face. No, he saw that bit. He didn't just carry on with the meeting. (laughs) I thought this was late in the presidency where he wasn't really paying attention anymore. (laughs) No, he didn't notice that she had a fake head on during the meeting. Had he not found it suspicious that Mrs Doubtfire wanted to have a meeting with him in the first place? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that London Bridge was destroyed by a tornado in 1091. What? (laughs) What? Like, I can't believe I didn't know this already. I thought, why are they not teaching it in schools? Mm. Why is it not a great movie? Yeah. (laughs) This is... This is incredible, this fact. This was one of the first London bridges. In fact, probably the first one we 100% definitely know about. Uh, There will have been some before, but we're not quite sure what happened to them. Uh, But it was William the Conqueror. He came into London in 1066. And one of his first things that he did when his army came in was they built a new bridge over the River Thames. And it was just 25 years later that it was completely demolished by a tornado. Uh, and we don't know much about it because obviously people didn't write much down in those days. Uh, but 12th century historian William of Malmesbury um, says that it was completely wrecked. There were also churches that were wrecked and there were more than 600 houses that were completely flattened. And we now think that it was an what's called an F4 tornado, which is the second strongest tornado you can get with winds what? over 200 miles an hour. Amazing. It's- is it how did, did he call it a tornado at the time? I've just realized. I mean, did, did he call it a mighty wind or a, or something else like that? Because presumably they didn't have the word then, did they? It's such a good question. They won't have had the word. So that's yeah. You answered your own question. Wow. <laughs> Actually, quite a bad question. You knew the answer. You're wasting everyone's time. <laughs> I didn't know. And only two people were killed apparently in this tornado. Good. That's so weird. Was no one in any of the 600 or whatever houses that were falling down? Oh, it's so Everyone's weird, Everyone's out, it? out at work. It sounds extraordinarily powerful. So the church of St. Mary Le Beau uh, had 26 foot high rafters and apparently they were driven so far into the earth by this tornado that only four feet of them remained above ground. Wow. Which I was wow. thinking... Because Mary Le Beau is a very famous church in London for those people who aren't Londoners, because that's if you're born within the sound of the bells of Mary Le Beau, then you are officially a cockney. And I'm guessing the bells weren't functioning once it was driven into the ground. So anyone born in that period couldn't be a cockney. That's incredible. How does that work that it shoved it into the ground? That's like a giant screwdriver. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm just putting myself in their place. You know, we don't know what this thing was. There was a giant spinny screwdriver in the sky, and it's and it's drilled some of our our big panels into the ground. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's when they changed traditional church architecture away from the screwdriver design um, to a less easy to drive into the ground shape. Yeah. That just seems, but that's a lot. That's twenty feet to yeah. go into the ground. London it's grounds very swampy. It's a lot. Look, they didn't have such good tarmac then. But the other thing that's interesting is that I think the London Bridge that would have, been, would have been destroyed by this tornado would have been way bigger than modern London Bridge because the river was so much wider at the time. That's a good well, point. Really? The river used to be about four or five times as wide as it is today. A lot of it's been reclaimed. So it would have been absolutely enormous. Yeah. I did read about a potential um, precursor to this London Bridge, which uh, is is much debated, but a lot of serious journals do think it that sides on the fact that it did exist. Um, And it's off the back of something that we know from Nordic law, um, which was there was a period in 1014 when um, Ethel the Unready had been trying to reclaim England. Is is Ethel the Unready related to Ethelred the Unready? (laughs) It was his (laughs) mum. Yeah, it was Ethelred. Ethelred, sorry, I said his name wrong. Yeah, (laughs) annoyingly, this fact has so much English history that I have to get to before I can explain the basic thing. The basic thing is the Danes were in charge of London at that point, and London Bridge was very much a spot where they could arm the whole thing with um, people with bows and arrows for anyone who was coming down the Thames. And so there was a a Viking called Olaf who tied uh, ropes underneath the bridge and went underneath with the tide and pulled London Bridge down, um, forcing all the soldiers to die and perish in the water. It was over 200 soldiers um, and helped for reclaiming England for the British as opposed to the Danes. 
Mm. And a poet called Otar Starvter did a, did a um, poem which was London Bridge is broken down, gold is won and bright reown. There's more to it, but that line, London Bridge is broken down, is thought to have inspired London Bridge is falling down. It, what's okay. really interesting is about the London Bridge is falling down thing, which is a lot of people think that it might be to do with that story. But then on the other hand, before that, there were other songs throughout the whole of Europe. So you would have um, Die Magdeburger Brück, the Magdeburg Bridge in Germany. And it was basically exactly the same idea oh. of a bridge that would fall down. And a lot of uh, nursery rhyme historians <laughs> think that <laughs> what happened was this was quite a common kind of European song. And then when it came over to Britain, they just gave it the name of the capital wow. city's most famous bridge. My, uh, my favourite version of the London Bridge was the one that was there during Shakespearean times. It just sounds like the most fascinating thing to have ever walked across. It was packed with houses uh, that were up to four stories high. It had restaurants on it. Restaurants that when you went to them, the way you would order your food is you would get fish as a sandwich, right? And they would open a trap door and they would put down a fishing rod. No. They would catch the fish live, no. reel it up, and then slap it raw in between bread and give Come that off to you. It, no. What, I mean, what, uh, right, I mean like, so many questions. Right, first, worst restaurant ever. If you're just going to raw fish. <laughs> bread. It's sushi. Can I say second... How are you going to yeah. guarantee if it's the Thames in the 16th century that you're not going to reel in a turd? Bingo. <laughs> well, that was that was the uh, exciting element of your dining experience. <laughs> that, that's the where the phrase comes from. I'd rather eat a shit sandwich than <laughs> well, <laughs> and, at this restaurant. And third, as we know, the sandwich in this country hadn't really been invented yet, so it doesn't make any sense. They would have reeled the fish up and had two bits of bread and gone. God, we don't know how to put these together. <laughs> and then it's out again. So, wh- where, where have you read this, Dad? This is amazing. I read this. I read this in a book by Dr. Matthew Green, um, a book oh. called London: A Travel Guide Through time. And this was a book that was published by my wife. And it's the most fascinating chapter because he takes you back to the time. So he has someone walking across the bridge in Shakespearean times. Uh, It would take you two hours to to walk the length of the entire bridge. It was so congested. And there was always a bit, apparently, during the day where it came to a standstill because you know how there was a polar bear at the Tower um, yeah. at the... Um, Tower of London. Sorry, what's it called? Tower of London, yeah. At the Tower of London. The, it was during the hour when he would be taken out to the Thames to be fed that people would <laughs> stand and just watch. It would come to a standstill because it was such a mad thing that a polar bear would be fishing for food. <laughs> he'd be, he'd be stealing sandwiches out of the mouths of hungry clientele at the restaurant as well. <laughs> Well, he's run off with my, oh, what's it called? <laughs> the, um, that polar bear wasn't there in Shakespearean times, was he? I thought he was like 13th century at the latest, wasn't he? I thought, yeah, I thought so, so. So, but this is this is the same bridge that I'm talking about. This is, oh, okay. this is because it spanned a long time. In the 14th century, we know how many people were actually living on it because we know the number of rent that was collected from properties. So there were 198 buildings that were all providing rental oh. revenue from that period. Yeah. And this, and this was bridge. the bridge. If you talk about all the London bridges of which there have been dozens of iterations, this was the one that lasted, what, 600 years or whatever, or maybe maybe longer yeah. even. Um, and, but it was because of this that they eventually dismantled that in the 1820s because it was so congested. And but it's, it's also because it was it. the only bridge. It was it was literally the only bridge across central London until 1739. So it feels weird for them to dismantle it and build another one when they could have just <laughs> built more bridges. <laughs> yeah, true. I was reading account of the um, dismantling and then they rebuilt it as a, a wider, more useful bridge. And the laying, you know, when they lay the first stone of a building or a bridge, mm. and there was this account in the British newspaper archive. It was 1925, and the Lord Mayor was invited to lay the foundation stone. And I didn't understand the ritual at all. So basically, he had a gold trowel um, with which he sort of <laughs> <laughs> dug it up, I guess. And then he dropped coins into a box. So there's a wooden box. He drops coins into a box which contains four little glass pillars, seven inches high. A lid's put on the box, and then the box is covered covered in cement and installed into a hole in the foundation stone and then that's dropped so if you went to the bottom of london bridge now with your scuba gear and then you cut away into some of the stones in one of them there's this little box full of glass pillars and these coins isn't that weird cool. that's really cool. cool um i know what happened to the previous foundation stone from the previous bridge oh, yeah. ah so was that the Anna? Was that the eighteen thirty one yes. version of London Bridge that you're talking about? Okay, so the previous one got lots of it got sold off as souvenirs. Um, so there are bits of various British country houses which are made of old London Bridge, 
but the stone got turned into a chair, the foundation stone. And it's in the base chair? of a chair. Where, where is, is the, the chair? chair? Yeah. It's in Fish Hall, which is kind of the fishing guild, the fishermen's ah, guild. Nice. And it's right by modern London Bridge now. And right. it's it's just a fancy chair, basically. But, That's um, so sad for that stone. So it spent its entire existence watching live fish swimming happily around, and now it's condemned <laughs> to this place full of dead, slaughtered fish yeah. ready for the table. Just have a fisherman's bottom on him every now and then. <laughs> we can't leave London Bridge alone without talking about what happened to that new 1831 version, which is now in America. So the idea was that it was sold to an American and he got conned, right? That's... Oh, well, people claim that, but he he insists he didn't. And I suspect he didn't. But yeah, basically, it's so Lon- that London Bridge is now in Havasu, which is in Arizona, because uh, this this crazy millionaire, in it was in 1968, <laughs> wasn't it, that it was put up for sale. And this millionaire in America bought it. And there's always been a rumour that he meant to buy Tower Bridge and mm. got the wrong one. But uh. I think he likes that because it drummed up even more publicity for the fact that he was moving London Bridge to the desert, which everyone thought wow. was insane. It's amazing because they, they installed it in a dry bit of the desert and then they redirected the nearby stream to go under it. So there is water going under it now, but the bridge was put there before the water was. <laughs> yeah, it is quite weird to have wow. to build a river in order to satisfy a bridge needs <laughs> rather than the other way around. <laughs> but the, the weird thing is that London put the bridge on sale in 1968. It wasn't like some yeah, mad yeah. Yosemite Sam millionaire turns up and says, I want to buy that bridge. It was that London was trying to flog it off. Yeah, but who did they think was going to buy it? Probably someone with a river. So they were probably yeah. quite surprised <laughs> when this guy got it. <laughs> they probably, when he came over, they were like, oh, nice, yeah, what, uh, what river are you going to put it over? <laughs> No river, no river. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Um. <laughs> it is worth saying, um, if this guy did make the mistake of Tower Bridge and London Bridge, that possibly a lot of international listeners uh, listening to this episode right now are making the very same mistake. The mm. the almost iconic bridge that you've pictured in your head, that's Tower Bridge. That's one where, where it opens up in the middle and it's got the huge two giant, um, I don't know what you call them, arches, whatever. Um, that bridge, the one you're thinking of. London <laughs> Bridge, very dull. It's a... <laughs> it's it's a it's terrible. It's horrible. Um, so you can understand. It's just, a road, bri- it's just a road bridge, isn't it? It's just, it is. uh, just a straight old bridge that <laughs> an unimaginative child might draw. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I did read an amazing thing, which was in 1952. This is a fact about Tower Bridge, the, the one that does open up in the middle. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Speed, where they have to jump the gap of a bridge... That happened on Tower Bridge with a bus driver in 1952. His name was Albert Gunter, and he was, during December, he was driving the number 78 bus, which goes from Shoreditch to Dulwich, and the person who would usually ring the bell to say that the bridge was going up forgot to ring it, and he noticed... (laughs) that the bridge was bending upwards as he was driving towards it. And he didn't have enough time to slam on the brakes because that would have been disaster. So he hit the accelerator and he jumped. He jumped across. Now, only his side had lifted up and he jumped a six-foot drop, basically, onto the northern side of the bridge. It's Um, still a lot on a massive bus. Exactly, on a massive bus. But he, yeah, someone jumped the gap of the bridge in 1952. (laughs) Did they remember to to put the sign over the tannoy saying, this bus is on diversion? Because that's not part of the planned route. Yeah, so he was okay in the end. He broke his leg, um, which was the only major um, problem. And 12 of the 20 passengers had minor injuries. Injuries, but so 21 people in total all yeah. survived this big bridge jump. And as a reward, he was given £10, which is about £290 in today's money, and uh, a day off for his bravery. Right. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's enough time for a broken leg to fully heal, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so some stuff on tornadoes. Mm. Yeah. It's really difficult to know when you read articles about tornadoes what's real and what isn't real because they happen in the middle of the countryside. The only people who see it are the people who are there at the time and they often seem to come up with some stories that I don't know if they're real or not. Like, <laughs> So there's a story um, from the start of the 20th century, I think it was in Kansas, where there was a man with a baby in his arms and the tornado came and lifted the baby up and deposited it in a tree. 
Oh, no. <laughs> Which doesn't sound very true. Um, but this, <laughs> apparently in 1976, um, this one seems like it might have been true. It was in Michigan. There was a tornado and there was a house which was blown by the tornado. So it went onto its side. So people oh. had to use a ladder to get into the front door. <laughs> <laughs> Well, apart from the side thing, it's looking pretty good in here. <laughs> but then there are some that there are some that are definitely not true. Like, for instance, um, in this 1915 one in Kansas, there was a story that an iron jug was blown inside out. <laughs> Whoa. I'm pretty sure that one isn't true. <laughs> I read one as well years ago, which was there was a mystery of a scuba diver found in a tree and he was fully he was fully clothed. No, Dan, and... no, I know what you're doing. <laughs> what? I'm, this Are you doing a... the famous um, mental brain teaser where they've been picked up by a... They've been scuba diving and they've been picked up by a helicopter that's trying but, to put out a fire. Was that a mental brain teaser? Yeah, okay, that sorry. wasn't a real story. <laughs> Dan thinks he's just come across an amazing fact website. <laughs> Look at all these anecdotes. <laughs> okay, but the room was locked from the inside. There were no windows. There was just a puddle of water. <laughs> the fish were called Romeo and Juliet. But the doctor is his mum. <laughs> okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that this year's Dutch National Headwind Championships was cancelled during the race because it was too windy. <laughs> so this is a, a cycling championship that's been going for the last six years, and the idea is that they don't know when it's going to happen. They look out for storms, and as soon as they hear a massive storm is on the way, they give everyone three days' warning to say, we're going to be doing this race, and they have to go down this one strip of 8.5 kilometers, and you just have to ride against the wind. And actually, it wasn't the cyclists who pulled out of it. It was the fact that it was the trucks carrying the bikes were being toppled over. Wow. So they couldn't so, physically get the bikes to them. So my friend Tom Scott, who's a YouTuber, was there. Yes. And he did a video about this. And he said that it, they didn't topple over, I think. They just, it was too dangerous for high-sided vehicles to go across. Mm, right. So I don't think any trucks actually went over. But they were just banned from going over. And what happens is everyone has kind of the same bike these kind of single speed upright bikes mm. and you cycle across and then this big lorry picks up the bikes and takes them all back to the start again so the next lot of people can go down and the lorry couldn't come across the bridge because it was banned and instead it would have to go on like a 20 mile route right rather than going that way mm. so they just cancelled it halfway through yeah but there is another way of moving bikes without a truck <laughs> and especially as coming back in the oh, other yeah, way yeah. you've got the wind <laughs> it's, it's bliss so much yeah, easier it's a good point this year they were going to they'd gone all out to make it even nicer than in the previous events and they had storm resistant seating for the spectators and a special designated vomit zone what? <laughs> yeah, it's really funny you can see it's these three big bin bags that are <laughs> sort of hung up and it has a big placard that says vomit zone and there's wow. little bike handles for you to hold as you're vomiting <laughs> into the rubbish you, bin. You don't want to be stood downwind of that as well, no. do you? <laughs> <laughs> Why do they need a vomit zone? The, Does it the get quite leery? The endurance of doing this race. So they say it's it's kind of like if you were going cycling up a hill that was a sort of 10% incline. Mm. Um, it feels, and you've got no On gears, a terrible bike as on well. On a terrible yeah. bike. Mm. And the whole thing is, you know, this, there are winners, but everyone is just wanting to finish it. It's an endurance thing. And they push themselves to the limit and it forces them to vomit wow. enough so that they've set up the vomit station. They should have vomit zones, surely, at the end of all marathons and all races and every They do. It's event. called the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wasn't it stopped also in 2017 because it wasn't stormy enough? <laughs> was it? <laughs> yeah, I think it was. There was an absolute... Because they need a certain level of wind, don't they? Yeah. So if it doesn't come... Mm. It doesn't come. And also the wind needs to be in exactly the right direction. So that's why they can only do it three days in advance. They need to know that the wind is not just going to be there, but it's going to be coming directly over the bridge. Yes. And this bridge is an amazing bridge, right? This is the uh, Uster Scheldekring, and it's a bridge that is basically a storm barrier bridge, and they're very proud of it there. Um, they have a little inscription on a stone which says, Here the tide is ruled by the wind, the moon, and us. 
It's sort of they're Ooh. so proud of how strong it is, which I saw on a video by your buddy, Tom Scott. Yeah. Um, really worth watching if you're listening to us right now. Talk about this. Um, you, he's on the side of the road. The wind is blowing in his head <laughs> and he's seeing people <laughs> ride past him. It's, it's fantastic. Isn't that sort of the beginning of a ancient Greek story about hubris where you end up getting swept away by the tide because you try to control what only God can control? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's um, King Canute, isn't it? It's Canute. Well, I think the Dutch are winning at the moment. They're nailing it. You're right. doing really well. Those Dutch bikes are really hard to cycle fast on. The mm. ones which don't have a, a bar at the top from the front to the to the yeah. back. They, they, they're yeah. in, they force you to cycle in a really sedate way. Um, another good race is the Red Bull Time Lapse. Uh, and they call that the longest one-day road cycling event. Do you know how many hours it's for? 24. No. <laughs> oh. Tricky. 25. Because uh, they do it when the clocks go oh, back. Is that right? right? When the clocks go nice. back, yes. Yeah. Mm. It's quite cool, isn't it? Yeah. And it's just a 6.2 kilometer course, and they see how many laps they can do in 25 hours. Nice. You could do the shortest one-day cycling event where you just cross the international date line. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's a and second. And you're just like, oh, I've been cycling for a day. Yeah. And actually, it's just one second. <laughs> yeah. That's great. <laughs> Apart from you're probably in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> you're dead, but you're yeah. smug. <laughs> I was reading, there's um, a bunch of cycling things that you can do where it's underwater, so underwater cycling. Oh, cool. um, and it's quite nice the way that they get the bike to stay at the bottom, which is they take all the air out of the bike wheels and they fill it with water. Okay. Oh. So when you plunge in, you just sink to the bottom with it and oh, it becomes easier to ride. How do they deal with the fact that humans are quite buoyant? Um, they replace all the air in their lungs <laughs> with water. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, that's probably what happens, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so, do, do you have to have weights? You must, oh, yeah, weights. You yeah, weight wait. belts and things like that to yeah, keep I'm you not down. Sure. Yeah, I, I didn't see that in the photo that I saw. Because some of them go quite deep, don't they, the underwater ones? Yeah. There's one, the underwater bike race in North Carolina, which seems to be the home of underwater bike racing, uh, where it's 60 feet underwater. And the race is across this shipwreck of a German U boat called the wow. Indra. And you ride 100 feet. So Oh, cool. Doesn't that that's the kind of thing you're going to book a holiday to go and do? Isn't I don't it? really like cycling or swimming, but I like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. Do it's you... like, I don't like chess or boxing, but I like. <laughs> <the sound. laughs> Um, I was looking at the slipstreams. This sort of oh, yeah. Yeah. air movement and cycling. Absolutely. And so slipstream, of course, is when you're... So you can get in a slipstream, for instance, if you're on a bicycle and you're behind a big vehicle. I do not recommend you do this. Uh, but the vehicle sort of pushes the air out of the way in front of it. So it creates this sort of negative pressure around you. But the record for how far someone cycled in a slipstream is held by a woman who's Denise muller Koronek, and she went at 184 miles an hour oh. in 2018 behind wow. a race car. Isn't that incredible? Wow. That is incredible. So she's pedaling, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to be pedaling. So you can't... Fuck. She's in such a high gear that you couldn't possibly start, so they yeah, have to get yeah. pulled along by the car at oh, first right, okay. until they're going at 100 miles an hour and then released, and then you pedal along Jeez. behind the car. Wow. wow. Should we move on to... Sure. Yeah. Oh, can I just talk yep. about one... Can I just talk about one other slipstream guy who yep. I love? who's the guy this guy called Charles Minthorne Mile a Minute Murphy Mile a Minute was added later he was the first person to ride a bicycle a mile in under a minute he was in 18 this is in 1899 and he persuaded a train engineer because trains were the only things that could go fast enough at the time to build some extra track for him that he could cycle along and then so two miles of track and then he would get dragged behind it in the slipstream and so he spent he spent 12 years planning this dreaming about it fantasizing wow. about it and uh, at first it didn't work because the train couldn't go fast enough. So he was there, capable of cycling. The train couldn't go fast enough. Eventually they got a bigger, better, faster train. And he ended up going so fast, burning rubber was flying up in his face because the track was warping and stuff. But uh, lots of people were watching. And um, he it got to the end of the track. So he's going faster than the train at one point because he, <sighs> he fell behind a bit because he lifted his hand up to sort of wave at one of his trainers. And I was like, oh, fuck, <laughs> I've just lost 50 feet. <laughs> so he caught up with the train going faster than the train. The bloody guy driving the steam train just cut the steam as soon as he got to the end. And so Charles went slam no, into the back no, of the train, oh flew off his bike at 60 miles an hour um, wow. and somehow got caught. There were two people standing in the train. <laughs> one caught one arm, the other caught no, the other arm. On. He dragged oh, him in no, no. <laughs> and they saved him. <laughs> that is amazing. Okay, it is time for our final fact of the show and that is Anna. My fact is that every week, planes drop 15 million flies on the border between Colombia and Panama. 
<laughs> okay, so we're expected to believe that, but a scuba diver in a tree <laughs> is far <Maybe>. fetched. <laughs> Maybe the scuba diver's hurling them out of the plane and he fell out too. I don't know. Um, this is this incredible, not story, true, true fact. And I read it in an article in The Atlantic by Sarah Zhang. It's a brilliant article. But it's about how it's 14.7 million screw worm adults. So it's the flies of the screw worm are dropped over this border and it's in order to keep down screw worm populations, weirdly. And it's been happening for over 50 years and it's because they're a terrible pest. So they were this awful blight in the US because they they destroy livestock for reasons that I have no doubt we'll go into in disgusting detail. So they started looking into how to get rid of them. It was sort of in the 1950s, the US Department of Agriculture started looking into eradicating them and decided to sterilize a bunch of screw worms drop them all over the continent and then those guys would shag as male screw worms they drop those guys would shag the females who only shag once in their life so if you shag a sterilized male that's it you're not having kids and thusly the screw worm blight is ended so the screw worm was screwed by screwing you could say very nice. Mm. Could say that should be their logo, <laughs> and and we should say I don't know if you said this, Anna, but um, the reason why it's in Panama between Colombia and Panama is they eradicated these flies from the whole of North America, but they still exist in South America, and the bit where Panama is is obviously very very thin bit of land. So if they can make sure that nothing gets past that little bit of land, then it means that nothing will come into North America. So that's why they flood Panama and Colombia with it, just to kind of create a barrier. And also to make a big buffer zone, I think, because at first they did try to make it a barrier with mm. Mexico, um, but because that's just a bit too close, Mexico's right there, they were like, we've got to make this big buffer zone. It's like the Eastern Bloc in the Cold War. Can we talk about the worms and how horrific they are? Mm. They lay their eggs in open wounds that's what their jam is and sometimes they go for mucous membranes if they can't find an open (laughs) wound but that's why they're so painful and horrific so you're living Um, in a mucous membrane are you yes yeah but um we're saving up and we hope to find an open wound soon (laughs) yeah and then they they sort of chew their way they chew their way really deep as well like they can get two inches down and they're just they're just awful they're awful there's a british tourist called rochelle harris in 2013 who had a screw fly Uh, who went into her ear. Uh, and there was like this weird buzzing and scratching and stuff and she didn't really know what it was and eventually they found Uh. out that she had these flesh-eating worms living inside her head. Uh, And then they interviewed her afterwards. I think this might have been the Daily Mail. They interviewed her afterwards and she said, I'm no longer as squeamish as I once was about bugs. How can you be after they've been inside your head? Oh. I just think, I think I that mean, would make me more squeamish. <laughs> it would make me way less likely to lie down in the garden if I've had a load of screwworms <laughs> in my brain. It sounds like one stayed in there and is running the show now. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Their name, it literally means flesh eating, which I love. Uh, so mm. their their scientific name is the Cochleomia hominivorax, and hominid is man, and vorax, like voracious, is eating, so oh. man devouring. Gosh. Which is fitting. Yeah. The actual discovery of the idea of sterilizing all of these um, screwworms and dropping them over um, had been called in the New York Times in 1970 the single most original thought in the 20th century. That was according to a lot of scientists at the time because it was down to a guy called Edward F. Kipling. uh, Sorry, Edward F. Knippling. Knippling? Nippling. I say it's nippling. It's usually a silent K, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's knippling. Either way, we can agree he does not make exceedingly good cakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go. Let's say nippling. Um, and he used to, as a child, he used to watch adult screwworms mate, and he obsessed over it. Um, not in a sexy way. He was he was watching a lot of his animals on a farm uh, be devoured by these horrible um, flesh eating species. And so, yeah, apparently that was just such an original thought that some scientists claim it's the single most original thought. Yeah, that was century. it. Was before the internet was invented, wasn't it? So <laughs> yes. um, yeah. he was really amazed in this Edward Nippling. Um, he died relatively recently i think and i saw a few obituaries of him apparently he named all of his pets after insects Isn't wow that cool? did, it, did but his pets were not insects no he had siamese cats okay. called okay. anthonymus and kulex that were named after a type of cotton boll weevil and a type of mosquito do you know how you get a screw worm out 
of someone. Um, <laughs> I do you lure it out somehow? You do. You use a treatment called bacon therapy. Um, which sounds which like such a much more enjoyable thing than it actually is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it just involves jamming raw pork into the breathing holes that the worm has, and it either suffocates and pushes its way out, or it finds it yummy and sort of goes towards the bacon. Oh. It is like fishing, though, isn't it? I think so I couldn't tell. It's so weird when they say that you use it to <laughs> block up the air holes because they're really small. I mean, that is a tiny rasher of bacon. Yeah. So I think, they, that, yeah, they're attracting them to them. And once you've got sort of 10 or 11 on your bacon, you reel it in, I suppose, don't you? From the if, it's, if you think it's like fishing, I'm not coming to your restaurant in the middle of London Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> the maggot sandwich. Flies off the shelves. They're a kind of blowfly. And I was wondering why we call blowflies blowflies. And mm -hmm. I think it's because they... So the first reference to flies being associated with the word blow is, comes from Shakespeare and around that time. And it was... People would refer to flies blowing you. So Cleopatra says, uh, lay me stark naked and let flies blow me. And that <laughs> rather... <laughs> okay. She wants that to happen rather than being taken prisoner. It's not as pleasant as you might think. It's more about it, some, something is referred to being fly blown when flies had laid their eggs all over it, basically, and ruined I it. I mean, if you go and see a prostitute and ask her to blow you, then make sure she doesn't come along with a load of maggots. <laughs> Tip a pile of maggots on your knee. You've got to be very careful. It's possible, is all I'm saying, if she happens to be an entomologist in her spare time. <laughs> a lot of crossover between the two. <laughs> um, so they do actually blow bubbles, blowflies, even though it's do not why they're called blowflies. They're oh. forever blowing bubbles. And it's to keep them wow. cool. This was discovered quite recently, and it's blowflies in Brazil. It's actually latrine blowflies, so they hang around in toilets. And they do this really clever thing where when they get hot, they blow brown bubbles out of their mouth, which I imagine are brown because they're latrine blowflies. <laughs> and the brown bubbles, when they're blown, they lose lots of heat because heat evaporates off them. And then they pop and they suck them back in. And then that spits a bit cooler it cools, them, is, cools the head right down. It's really clever, that, isn't it? Yeah. It's like having bubble gum and then blowing it and then it gets cold on the outside and then you suck it back into your body and get the coolness. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. If your bubble gum was made of other people's feces. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a hubba bubba flavour as far as I know. <laughs> I've just got one more thing. Um, I started looking into insect factories off the back of this because there's a factory which grows these screw worms. Um, there's a firm called EntoCycle, which is currently hoping to breed millions and millions of soldier flies and then turn them into protein powder. So you breed millions oh. of flies which are eating rubbish. They're eating old coffee yeah. grounds. And then... And then do they give they that are... to, like, cattle and stuff? So exactly. Right. That's the hope. And then the hope is that you don't need so much um, soya to be grown and that, you know, which needs, uh, that takes up land that used to be the so Amazon clever. rainforest. So yeah, it's a genius idea. And this firm, EntoCycle, is based in London Bridge. Oh, oh yeah. Nice. Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, Andy, at Andrew Hunter M, James, at James Harkin, and Anna. You can email podcast at qi.com. Yep, or you can go to our group account, which is at no such thing, or you can head to our website, no such thing as a fish.com. We have all of our previous episodes there and links to a bunch of merchandise. Also, you'll find the links to our live show that we're going to be doing on the 18th of July, the drive in show. Just go to qi.com slash fish events. You'll find the link there. And also, please do donate to that care workers charity by simply going to qi.com slash donate. And um, yeah, we'll be back again next week, guys. As ever, we hope that you're safe. We hope you're well. Uh, uh, thank you so much for listening to us still in this crazy, crazy time. We'll continue doing it and we'll be back again next week with another episode. We'll see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye.